Um, so let's hit the end of Philippians now, Philippians 4. Um, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my beloved, my dearly beloved. Wow, he says, listen to that. He says, my brethren, my dearly beloved and longed for. He longs to see them. And remember, he longs for them in the inward parts of Christ Jesus, according to chapter 1. That's Christ's longing for his, for the fellowship. Christ longs to be with us. Jesus Christ longs for fellowship with us. Because remember, he said, God is my witness how I long for you all in the inward parts of Christ Jesus. And here's that longing again, my dearly beloved brethren, longed for. Whose feeling is that? Is that just Paul? No. He's already said that God is his witness, how he longs for them all in the inward parts of Christ Jesus. And that would include all of us who are the brethren. We are dearly beloved. We are longed for by Jesus Christ himself. And guess what? We're also his joy and crown. On the one hand, they are Paul's joy and crown, meaning that he was the reason they got saved. And he's the one who's the steward responsible for dispensing the riches of Christ to them furnishing them, raising them up in him. But Paul's an extension of Christ. And in a sense, we all are. We're members of his body. And when we function, it is the operation of the measure in each one part. And that measure is Christ himself. So that's why we cast our crowns at the feet of Jesus at the Bema seat, because it's all his work. Okay. And we are his crown. We are his joy. We are his beloved. We are his dearly beloved. We're his longed for. I mean, you could just meditate on that. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I'm a brother of Christ. I'm a co-heir with Christ. I'm dearly beloved. I'm longed for. I'm his joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord. In other words, stand fast in the Lord, uh, based on everything I've said in this way. So everything in chapter three, beware the dogs, beware the concision, beware the Judaizers, be the circumcision, learn to forget everything that lies behind, uh, pursue Christ to know him and gain him. Stand in the Lord. Don't stand in your own righteousness. Be found in Christ. He says, my dearly beloved again. Now he's warming them up because he's about to address an issue that apparently was a big enough deal for him to have to address it. It got back to him through Epaphroditus, probably, that Euodius and Syntyche had some kind of issue. But it must not have been that serious. But, see, even little issues, when the fellowship is really fine-tuned and rich, little tiny issues can be the foxes to spoil the vine. Clearly, neither of these people are off doctrinally. They're his laborers in... They're, they're so appreciated. They must have had some little something pop up that triggered somebody's hot button or their flesh or their vanity, and it was threatening to become an issue. And he's getting, getting it at the root. That's what I believe. I, don't be, I believe it could be a big issue, but wasn't. Because the root of bitterness will spring up and defile many. It is so... We, we have no idea the level at which the devil works to despoil any chance we have at fellowship. And he does it through misperceptions, vanity, hurt feelings, exaggerating the uh, em emphasis on the wrong syllables of what somebody said to make it sound more intense than it was. And then somebody gets offended and then they try to reinterpret it and, and, and it goes back and forth. And before you know it, more people are involved as witnesses. And then, I mean, it just goes out of proportion. Now, that's true of a healthy fellowship. How much more, obviously, does the enemy send people who are the enemies of the gospel that we just need to be aware of them altogether? The enemies of the cross. you got to avoid those altogether. Neither of these fall into the category of an enemy of the cross. Neither of these fall into the uh, uh, dogs or Judaizers or anything like that. These are precious sisters, I guess, in the Lord. But he says... I beseech Odius and I beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. In other words, the admonition is equally given to each of them as an individual to come back to the same mind. And he already told us what that same mind is. 
It's one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Contending for the gospel. Get your focus back on the gospel. Whatever it is, you've lost sight of that to some degree. And he says, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow. And that word is awesome. It's it, we, are, we are bound together bearing the same yoke, but the Lord is the one who's the ox with the strength to really carry it. It's his burden and it's light for us. Yoke fellow, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and which with other of my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. In other words, okay, yes, I'm addressing these people, but I want you guys to know that they're held in honor, and I want you to see the honor in which I hold them. D don't let their flesh right now cause you to forget who they are in Christ and what, how I value them. And I want you to help them get along. So in other words, you don't want to take sides. You want to help make peace between the two of them. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Um, be care Now, he's, these are general admonitions to the whole church, right? Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. This is the stuff we're familiar with. Thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which passes understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, the... He says, let your moderation be made known to all men. That we should be characterized by moderation, not extremes. Um, in Ecclesiastes, it says, don't be overly righteous. <laughs> Everything, even in righteousness, needs to be handled in moderation so that you don't lose your humanity. You know, some people are so strict uh, that they're an intolerable burden to everyone. You've got to be able to kind of send them in a well estate. You've got to be able to deal with common people if you're going to be in fellowship. I mean, these are just, this is just kind of practical stuff. But the extreme is a lack of sobriety. Moderation to me sounds like sobriety. Sober-minded. You know, if you're flipping out with every single, you know the Lord is at hand. You know, he says, let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Does it sound like moderation when the Christians are going, oh my gosh, there's baby parts in the vaccines and if you take it, it's going to be the mark of the beast and you might even lose your salvation and Jesus is coming, you better get right with God. And you're urgent, now, urgent, rapture, now, now, now. No, that is not moderation. That's embarrassing when you think of it. Be precisely because the Lord is at hand, we should be moderate, moderate. And, you know, we should be aware of what's going on in the world, but not freaking out about it. Um, we should be able to have a discussion about it without getting all freaked out. If you're freaked out about it, your mind is not renewed, you know. And, uh, it, you know, the Lord is at hand. That means he's, not only is he coming, but he's present. The reason we're able to be moderate is because no matter when we are in history related to his coming, we're in his hand now. And we enjoy him. And we rejoice in the Lord always. Right? We are a rejoicing people because of the spirit of Jesus Christ. And we enjoy the supply. And we enjoy the fellowship. And we do all things in moderation. Because the Lord is at hand. Um, and then be anxious for nothing. So anxiety is not a fruit of the spirit. And if, if so-called ministries are producing anxiety, you need to stop paying attention to those ministries. Those are not ministries. They are not dispensing food if, you're be, if you're, your reaction is anxiety. You know, I, I do believe in conspiracy theories and the Illuminati and the Antichrist and the prophecies and everything. And I've studied it for years. But I hate to see people merchandised. And I hate to see people caught up in it to where they can't approve that, which is excellent because they're so bound up in fear. And, you know, you go to some of these prophecy channel, their walls, and you watch what people say. And you can see these people are not in the word. They're hanging on every word that this watchman, so-called, is saying. And they're hoping 
that that Watchman is right about the rapture because that Watchman has spent several years describing in detail how it's about to be hell on earth and they're full of anxiety and their hope is that they can get rescued from the picture that the Watchman painted. That is not ministry. I mean, if there's anything to say shame on you about, it's that. People with 30,000 subs putting out urgent updates several times a day that are all just fear and yet a penny with but we're not afraid no you aren't afraid because it doesn't seem like you even believe this stuff you don't live like someone that believes that we're gonna be raptured out of here any minute uh you know <laughs> meanwhile you're not paying attention to the fact that your subs are not getting grounded in the word and they're hanging on you for every word and you're given contradictory updates every other week that new evidence that the rapture is here that contradicts the evidence you gave two weeks prior to that and not ever correcting yourself endorsing weird channels <laughs> with crazy dreams and stamping the Lord told me and the Lord told me on all of it it's disgusting when I I mean I'm how can I, it's hard for me not to think, let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand, and not think about what's going on in YouTube, you know, because it's the exact opposite. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. Now, I like that, with thanksgiving, you know, um, we're praying with thanksgiving because we already know it's done. I used to spend a lot of time praying for practical things because I thought I had to, but it felt like a burden. I never had any life in it. I hated it. Why do I have to pray for all these things if God already knows what I need before I ask? Can't I keep it simple? Can't I just say, thank you, Father, you supply all my needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Thank you that you know my needs. Lord, I just trust you. I put myself in your hands and I trust your goodness. Thank you for supplying for me. That's how I pray now. I, you know, I got problems. I got financial worries and stuff. And my response is, Lord, thank you. I trust you. I've learned to pray that way because I don't have the tenacious strength that some people have to specifically pray over every detail of their life. Uh... And I don't know, you know, I do believe that there's people who are called to intercession and they get these burdens from the Lord and stuff like that. But um, I like this verse <laughs> because it just says, you know, don't be anxious. If you come, it's, it's like when you come across anxiety, give it over to the Lord and thank him that he's the provider. Just keep yourself in the Lord. That's the important thing. And that's the focus of prayer is to just... Be refreshed in the Lord and stay with him. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, I've heard so many teachings when I was in religious Christianity where they'd say, okay, you need to pray about that thing until you have a peace. And if you don't have a peace, it's because you didn't give it over to the Lord. And it's like you would pray and pray and pray about something that you really, by the time you're done caring, praying about it, you didn't feel any better, you know, because you didn't really believe because your whole focus was on the situation. And it is true. You didn't give it over to the Lord. But really, I found the best way to give it over to the Lord is to forget about it. <laughs> and instead, I spend my time acknowledging who he is and what he's provided. He is the answer to all my problems. As many as are the promises of God, they are yes and amen in Christ. Every promise in the scripture finds its yes in him. And he has promised to abundantly supply all my needs and take care of me. And if I go through anything difficult, he's there with me. And so it's just kind of become a lot more simple for me. And that's not to say sometimes I don't get hit with anxiety. But now my response to anxiety is to start thanking the Lord and preaching the gospels of myself. And that pretty much gets me through, you know. It's the only answer I know. Um... The peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And that is the present Christ, the Lord who's at hand. You can be in the middle of a really anxious world and be free from anxiety 
and kept by the power of God and have his peace guarding your heart and mind in Christ. And that is your moderation. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is near. You're just not freaking out. You're not moved. You're still plodding along because to you, one day or another is all the same in the Lord. He is I am. You know. Uh, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. To me, preach the gospel to yourself. But I remember when the dreamers were launching all their stuff against me, all their dreams were so filthy, you know, that they believed were from God. They were not according to this character at all. They weren't pure. They weren't honest. They weren't, there was no justice. There was nothing lovely, nothing of good report. That's the stuff that edifies. And the only person and the only thing in the universe that has all these characteristics is Christ himself. And that's why it's the gospel that brings these things out. It's as we explore the rich of, riches of our inheritance in Christ that we can have a mind like this. It's not just think happy thoughts. It's not listen to Tony Robbins so you can learn how to be a happier person. It's I need wisdom and discernment and revelation, a spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that I can approve the things which are excellent and be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory of God. And I need the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. That's it. I want Christ to be magnified in me. I want to be found in Christ. I want to know him. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ. See, don't we always read Philippians 4 as if it's separate from Philippians 3 or 2 or 1. And it's not. If he's talking about these things, he's talking about Christ. And the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. And knowing Christ. And being found in him. And seeking to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And to taste the sweetness and become the drink offering. All that language is still in play when we come here. And so many people, I've heard people pray in prayer circles when they get, you know, they'll pray Ephesians or Philippians 4. And they'll talk about true, honest, just, pure, lovely. And they'll start thanking God for flowers and trees and for the weather and you have to sit there and endure it while they're going, Lord, thank you for the beautiful weather we've had. And thank you for the... I, and Lord, we just love to think about the fact that you made flowers for us. I mean, you know, it's just like, oh, there's those... It's so boring, I want to fall asleep. There's no Christ in it. No life. But when you attach this chapter to the previous chapters, you should be filled with the kind of language that comes from those chapters. Oh, thank you, Father. We don't have any confidence in ourselves. We can do nothing. We don't have confidence in the flesh. Lord, we thank you that we have died with you. We thank you that we're abundantly supplied by your spirit. We thank you that all of our situations turn out to be salvation for us. And Christ is being magnified. Oh, for us to live is Christ. Lord, we would seek to know you. We want to be filled with you, satisfied with you, rejoicing in you, and overflowing with you. See, that's, that all comes from those previous chapters. So, that's what he's talking about here. He's not talking about something else. You know what I'm saying? Um, these things, which is everything he said in this epistle, which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. In other words, I live the reality of this stuff, I'm telling you. Do it, and the God of peace will be with you. And what does Paul show them to do? Well, be found in Christ. And acknowledge him and discern him and approve of him and behold him and rejoice in him or preach the gospel to yourself. Uh, and the God of peace will be with you because the word and the spirit bring the presence of Christ himself. That's what we want. We don't want to just think about Jesus. We want the present Christ. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. The God of peace will, uh, what is it? The peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. 
These things which you've learned and received and heard and seen in me do in the God of peace will be with you. Let your moderation be known uh, by all men because the Lord is at hand. We're talking about a present Christ. We're talking about the supply, the bountiful supply, the spirit of Jesus Christ working out to your salvation. We're talking about God operating in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure so that you shine as a luminary. We're talking about being found in Christ and counting everything as dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ and seeking to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. This is intimate knowledge of a present Christ. That is our salvation. Not just, we'll go to heaven someday, but Christ today is in my life. And that's why I'm not anxious. I'm not anxious because I have the indwelling Christ. And I'm, fill, I'm getting filled with him to overflowing. And then he says, uh, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care has flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. In other words, they went through, he went through a time of need. They weren't able to meet the need. But now Epaphroditus has come, right? And not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to be abound everywhere. And in all things, I'm instructed to be full and to be hungry, to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Again, here's the present Christ. The, the spirit of Jesus Christ working all things together for my salvation, that Christ is magnified in my body, for me to live as Christ, and God is operating in me, both the will and do of his good pleasure, and I'm not anxious for anything, but the peace of Christ is guarding my heart and mind, and the Lord is at hand. See, he's a present Christ, strengthening Paul through the supply of the Spirit. That's how he can go through everything, and it doesn't matter if he's in prison, or in shipwreck, or in... Uh, situation of 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 you know bounty his situate his inward state is the same he's been trained to live christ for me to live is christ um notwithstanding you have well done you did communicate my affliction now the uh, philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when i departed from macedonia no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving but you only for even in thessalonia Thessalonica, you sent once again to my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I do desire the fruit that may abound to your account. And, but I have all, and I abound. And I'm full, having received of Epaphroditus the things you sent from me. An odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. He brings it back to that priesthood language. The drink offering, the sacrifice and service of your faith, and here, the odor of a sweet smell sacrifice acceptable well-pleasing to god and their provision for him it's all based on christ the real offering right but my god shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by christ jesus now unto god and our father be glory forever and ever amen salute every saint in christ jesus the brethren that are with me greet you all the saints salute you chiefly those that are of caesar's household and some have said that that is the victory of Paul's life. You know, that is most, his most victorious statement. Because the gospel getting into Caesar's ho household pretty much guaranteed that it gained a foothold in the center of power in the Gentile world and had a secure place and wouldn't fade out. Um, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Uh, grace is something that's with you. Grace is Christ with you. Grace is not just something God does for you. Grace is God in Christ with you as the Spirit, supplying you, strengthening you, working everything for your salvation, operating in you, and teaching you to live Christ. Um, okay, well, that's Philippians 4 at the end of Philippians. Uh, that was pretty short and pretty good. Take care.